great empire, but he couldn't control himself. Daniel warned Nebuchadnezzar that the God who controlled all the kingdoms of the earth would humble him if he didn't change his ways. The warnings fell on deaf ears. Instead of giving God the glory, Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as the source of greatness. The book of Daniel describes how God humbled this proud king and how God taught him there was a kingdom far more powerful than Babylon, a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. While walking one day on the roof of his palace, Nebuchadnezzar, at the height of his greatness, looked out over the city. He just couldn't help himself. He boasted, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle feathers and his nails like bird claws. He was given over to insanity. For seven years, he behaved more like a wild beast than a human being. At the end of the seven years, Nebuchadnezzar's mind was restored, but the experience had taught him a crucial lesson. It is perhaps the key lesson in the book of Daniel. God, not petty princelings, holds ultimate authority over this world. The Bible records Nebuchadnezzar's warning to those who would follow him in positions of power and authority. Whether in the cabinet room or the boardroom, it's advice that all of us would do well to heed. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? Everything He does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. But if Nebuchadnezzar had learned this important lesson, his descendants had not. After a 43-year reign, Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 BC. He was succeeded by four kings within a period of seven years, each successor weaker than the one before. The last king of Babylon was Nabu-Nayad, or Nabonidus. He seized the throne in 555 B.C. His son and crown prince was Belshazzar, uzzur the one the Bible calls Belshazzar. For reasons not fully clear, the scholarly and eccentric Nabonidus spent the last ten years of his reign at the distant oasis of Tima in Arabia. He was studying history and religion. While Nabonidus was away, his son Belshazzar ruled in Babylon. Now comes a fascinating piece of Bible detective work. For centuries, Belshazzar's name was found nowhere outside the book of Daniel. Historians named Nabonidus as Babylon's final king, but no Belshazzar. No wonder some skeptics rejected Daniel's statements about Belshazzar, labeling them fiction or one of the Bible's historical mistakes. But in 1854, several small clay cylinders came to light. They were found here, at Ur of Mesopotamia. They were inscribed with accounts of the rebuilding of this ziggurat by King Nabonidus. The inscriptions concluded with prayers for the health of Nabonidus and for his eldest son, the crown prince, Belshazzar. And as for me, Nabonidus, the king of Babylon, protect thou me from sinning against thine exalted godhead and grant thou me graciously a long life. And in the heart of Belshazzar, my firstborn son, set the fear of thine exalted Godhead. This archeological find is important for the story of Daniel because the inscription sheds light on Belshazzar's command in the fifth chapter of Daniel in verse 29. This is where Belshazzar proclaimed Daniel the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Nabonidus was first, Belshazzar was second, and Daniel the third. 
This is a striking example of the Bible's often minute accuracy. It was during Belshazzar's reign that God gave his prophet Daniel another important vision. Once again, he saw a prophetic overview. Daniel saw a succession of empires that would control the ancient Near East from his day forward. Four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. After this, I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. To those of us living at the end of the 20th century, depictions of strange looking beasts seem curious and bizarre. But to ancient people, composite beast-like creatures were far more familiar. This raises an important point in understanding prophecy. Some Bible interpreters make the mistake of trying to explain biblical symbolism without reference to a book's historical background. Elaborate speculations soon follow. To avoid this trap, it is vital to determine the meaning of a book or a text in its original setting. The key question is, what did this mean to the people who first heard it? This is a sound principle of good Bible study. For the people of Daniel's time, composite animals had meaning. Living and working in Babylon, Daniel saw these depictions every day. Let's take the famous dragon of Marduk, for example. It was a favorite decoration piece in the city, used by artists to ornament the Ishtar Gate. It's a hybrid or composite beast. It has the front legs of a cat. The hind legs have claws like a bird of prey. Its head has the double horns of the Arabian horned viper, and its tail ends in a scorpion sting. These strange mystical beasts had important religious significance for the ancient Babylonians. So when Daniel recorded the strange animals of his vision in chapter 7, he realized the vision was going to be significant for Babylon. An angel explained to Daniel that the four beasts were four empires that would dominate the ancient Near East. The winged lion symbolized Babylon itself. Interestingly, the lion of Babylon is found to this day on the ancient site of the city. In 1176 AD, local villagers in Iraq discovered this monumental basalt lion. It confirms the lion was the symbol of the goddess Ishtar and of Babylon itself. The lion stands over a fallen enemy trampled beneath its paws. The lion's back has markings indicating that it was meant for Ishtar's saddle. A woman riding a beast? This would be a significant image later on in the book of Revelation. According to many commentators, the bear in the vision symbolized the Medes and the Persians. And sure enough, the Medo-Persian Empire replaced Babylon. The four-headed leopard has four wings. It represented Alexander the Great and the four divisions of his empire after his death. The fourth beast has been identified by many Bible commentators as corresponding to the Roman Empire. The book of Daniel paints a vivid picture of the transition from Babylon, the Lion Kingdom, to the Bear Kingdom. It's one of the most famous scenes of the Bible. It was October 539 BC. Apparently during the New Year's festival, Belshazzar had planned a great feast. The king had invited a thousand of the leading men of his empire for the celebrations. Little did they realize what was going to happen. What made this great banquet so unusual was that it took place while the Persians were besieging Babylon. Yet Belshazzar's faith rested in the mighty walls of the city. That fatal overconfidence would be his undoing. It was during the banquet, in a great show of arrogance in the face of God, that Belshazzar ordered wine to be served. He then toasted the gods of Babylon. He did this with the very golden cups his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had plundered from the temple in Jerusalem. Suddenly, a strange, terrifying event occurred, probably right here in the throne room of Belshazzar, 
A mysterious disembodied hand appeared out of nowhere. It began to write great blazing letters on the king's wall. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king and said, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. And this is the inscription that was written, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Parson. This is the interpretation of each word. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Taken literally, the words Mine, Tekel, and Perez were the names of common Babylonian weights. Before coins were invented, business was conducted using metal ingots as currency. They had to be weighed in a balance against accurate measures, like this two mina lion weight, to test their worth. Daniel's interpretation of the writing on the wall played on the root meaning, mini, which means numbered, tekel, which means weighed, and parson, divided. Babylon's time had run out. As the Bible tells the story, on that very night, while the ominous writing glowed upon the wall, the armies of Cyrus the Great were already entering the city. Babylon's mighty walls and massive fortifications could not prevent its downfall, a downfall decreed by God. The prophet Isaiah gives us some background to King Cyrus and his part in the fall of Babylon. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. This scripture hints at the remarkable way Cyrus was able to capture Babylon. With its massive walls, Babylon seemed impregnable. But unknown to the Babylonians, Cyrus had devised an ingenious plan. The Bible doesn't give the specifics, but it's described in great detail by the ancient historians Herodotus and Xenophon. While Belshazzar feasted, Persian troops were busy upstream, diverting the course of the Euphrates River. The river normally flowed under the massive gates and through the city. So the Persians dug a channel. This redirected the river into an old lake bed. The Euphrates began to lower, permitting the Persians to wade under the gates and into Babylon under cover of darkness. Reports tell us that Cyrus placed a spy in the city. That very night, he unlocked the gates of the inner wall. Through these gates, Cyrus's army poured into the city. The Babylonians were completely surprised. Babylon was so large that when the outer parts were invaded, those living in the center of the city were unaware of the attack. Belshazzar and his guests continued their idolatrous defiance of God until it was too late. As the book of Daniel tells us, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. The greatest city of the ancient world had fallen. The head of gold, which we saw in Daniel 2, had been replaced by the chest and arms of silver, the lion by the bear. Babylon was the economic colossus of the ancient world, but it had become a byword for moral decadence and corruption. Its leaders had become drunk with their own power. The fall of Babylon teaches a lesson we are only too prone to forget. God rules in history. It's a lesson for us today. Babylon was finished as a great power. Yet Babylon had fallen before. Would it? 
Could it rise again?